All right, everybody. Well, thank you for being here today. It is my, my great pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to introduce today's speaker, Alessandra Solete. Uh, Alessandra received her PhD in mathematics in 1989 from ETH Zurich, where she studied under the supervision of Professor Jurgen Moser. Uh, her thesis focused on computer assisted proofs and KAM and celestial mechanics. She's full professor of mathematics, of mathematical physics at uh, the University of Rome, Torvergata, and is currently vice president of the governing board of the Italian National Agency for Evaluation of Universities and Research Institutes. She is editor in chief of Celestial Mechanics and Dynamical Astronomy and president of Commission A4 on Celestial Mechanics of the International Astronomical Union. She's a world expert on nonlinear analysis, KAM theory, celestial mechanics. Uh, and I'm told even that the uh, celestial body, asteroid N117539, was named after her. So uh, all that being said, I'm delighted to hand things over to Alessandra. Thank you, Jay. So thank you very much. And uh, so I start to share the screen. So let me start uh, this talk. I want to thank you for the invitation and uh, um, uh, today, what uh, I will talk about uh, KM computer assisted results uh, result in celestial mechanics, and in particular on a problem which is called uh, uh, the spin orbit problem. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Renato Calleja, uh, Jean Guimeno, who is here, and uh, Rafael de la Llave also attending the, this seminar. Um, so let me start uh, with an introduction, and uh, I would like to to bring your attention on different aspects of celestial mechanics, which strongly motivated the, the development of mathematical theory so to study the stability of physical models, especially this is a timeline and especially if things happened in the last row of the timeline, thanks to Laplace, Lagrange, uh, Le Verrier, Delaunay, and then Poincaré. So th with the development of perturbation theory and, and later with the uh, Kolmogorov, Arnold Moser, and Necroche theory. So uh, why perturbation theory? Because uh, uh, we need to start with the two body problem. Although Jai was uh, giving a very nice introduction last week during his talk. And uh, um, so let me say that if you take uh, the Sun Earth system, then you know that the system is integrable in the sense that uh, the motion of the moon uh, or the earth around the sun is uh, an ellipse uh, where the sun is in one focus. So you have an integrable problem that you can describe in uh, action angle coordinates by Hamiltonian function, which depends just uh, on the actions. So J denotes the actions here and phi the angles. So you have this, this Hamiltonian here. And of course, uh, the Hamilton's equations can be integrated as uh, J dot uh, J equal to is a constant and phi is uh, a linear function of the time. So this holds uh, for the two body problem, sun, earth. What happens if uh, you, in, uh, you put Jupiter also? So the earth under the gravitational attraction of sun and Jupiter. Then uh, you need to modify the Hamiltonian and to represent it as a nearly integrable Hamiltonian with the integrable part again, uh, providing uh, the sun earth interaction. And then there is a perturbing function, which is epsilon times uh, a function R, which represents uh, the gravitational attraction with Jupiter. And here epsilon is, uh, uh, the mass is short for the mass ratio between Jupiter and Sun, which in reality is uh, 10 to the minus three. So then we write down Hamilton's equations associated to this uh, new Hamiltonian function. And uh, as Poincaré showed, we know that, and uh, they, they say the Hamilton's equations cannot be integrated. And so we need to find the solution and we can find the approximate solutions uh, thanks to perturbation theory and also thanks uh, to Nekoroshe theorem. Um, well, uh, what, what is uh, the advantage of using perturbation theory? What, uh, what kind of results can we obtain? So let me jump back to 1846 to give uh, maybe the, 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 that one, which was uh, the most astonishing results of perturbation theory. Because in 1846, uh, Le Verrier postulated the existence of an extra planet behind the last planet known at that time, that was Uranus. He made uh, some computations based on, on perturbation theory. This is uh, the original manuscript. And uh, he conjectured the existence of an extra planet uh, uh, able to uh, justify the discrepancies between the theory 
and the observations of the motion of Uranus. So he gave uh, in this letter he to, uh, that was addressed to an ast astronomer, Jan Gall in Berlin, he gave a very precise within five degrees uh, of approximation, the position of uh, uh, this extra planet. Uh, the uh, Gall received uh, the letter five days later. On the same day, he observed, he pointed the telescope to the sky and uh, discovered Neptune. So that was uh, the discovery of a planet uh, with a pen and paper, that is uh, with perturbation theory. So we are convinced now that perturbation theory is extremely powerful. But uh, then the question is, uh, the second ingredient is, uh, uh, it, it is powerful, but is it easy to uh, implement, is it easy to implement perturbation theory? So let me give uh, another example. This time, again, the same time, but due to Charles Delaunay, who was an astronomer and mathematician who spent 20 years of his life to study the motion of the moon. Uh, he gave uh, one of the most precise computations of the ephemeris of the moon still used nowadays by uh, the space agencies. And the reason why he spent uh, 20 years, I think is, uh, uh, can be uh, easily understood uh, reading uh, his book, wonderful book, uh, which is uh, the theory of the motion of the moon, which is uh, in fact two books uh, composed each one by 1000 pages, where it, Delaunay in the first few pages gives uh, the, the, the equations of motion, some preliminary computations. And then he starts to give the Hamiltonian function that he needs to study to get uh, and to get uh, the precision that he wants to develop. But he needs to study this Hamiltonian function that I'm shown now, which is a Hamiltonian function expanded in uh, Taylor series in the orbital elements, semi-major axis, eccentricity and inclination. Gamma is the sine of I over two and in trigonometric expansions of uh, the angles, uh, mean anomaly, argument of perigee, and longitude of the ascending node. Okay, so whatever the meaning, is, the, the, the meaning of these symbols are, um, uh, let me say that uh, the Hamiltonian function starts at page uh, 33, as you can see here, continues at pages uh, 34, and again at page 35, 36, 37, and then up at page 54. So 22 pages just to give uh, the starting Hamiltonian function. So you can understand that uh, he spent 20 years uh, to make uh, computations with perturbation theory, which uh, were, by the way, checked uh, with the computer by Dupree in 1969. And he found just uh, two small mistakes in some coefficients we were not essential. So we had these two ingredients. On one side, we had that perturbation theories are very powerful. On the other one, that they are computationally difficult. But now today I want to, to talk about not about perturbation theory in general, but rather about something which is a development of perturbation theory that is KM theory. So let us start to enter this field now. KM theory deals with the quasi-periodic motions and invariant tori in non-integrable Hamiltonian systems like those I was uh, showing before, like the three body problem but also with uh, some dissipative systems uh, that I call conformally, I will call conformally synthetic systems. The original versions of KM theory were developed for nearly integrable systems. Uh, in a recent work, fairly recent work, in fact, in this uh, 2013 with Rafael and Renato, we developed uh, a, a, an efficient KM theory for conformally, for some dissipative systems, which are called the conformally synthetic systems. Um, and let me say, since now that adding a dissipation to a Hamiltonian system is in fact a very singular perturbation, because while in the conservative case, you can have many quasi-periodic solutions as you want, in the dissipative case, you can have just a few attractors. And moreover, you need to include the drift drift parameters, a fact that was well known since remarkable papers and pioneer papers like the outstanding work by Moser in 1967 on my mathematician Allen, and then the works by Hank Brewer, Carles Simo, and so on. So we need to, 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 our focus will be a KM theory for dissipative systems, which require these extra parameters. And besides, we need to uh, satisfy some well-known assumptions, which are frequently used in, uh, in a KM theory, which are the fact that uh, we need an assumption on the frequency, it must satisfy the Yoffentheim condition to get rid of the small divisors and a non-degeneracy condition that is a, a, a condition that ensures the solution 
of co some cohomological equations can be found and they provide approximate uh, solutions. So, uh, as I was saying before, the problems of the main problems of celestial mechanics are indeed modeled by nearly integrable Hamiltonians, not only the three body problem, but also the uh, problems in rotational dynamics, uh, as I, I will show later, like the spin orbit problem. And they are ruled by one parameter, which is the perturbing parameter, typically the mass ratio in the three body problem, or rather the equatorial, uh, the, the, the oblateness parameter in the spin orbit problem. When Nevertheless, uh, in celestial mechanics, it is uh, very important to understand also the role of the dissipation because uh, dissipation very often drives uh, the evolutionary history of planets and satellites. And dissipation is typically smaller than the conservative counterpart. So I will talk about a nearly Hamiltonian system that is uh, a, a, a dissipative system with the dissipation, which is uh, less than the conservative counterpart. And it is ruled by two parameters, which are the conformal factor lambda, which measures the dissipation, and this drift parameter mu that we need to insert in order to find the toray. An example will be the spin orbit problem, which is nearly integrable and with a small dissipation. And beside the dissipation is, uh, will be a linear function of the velocity, which makes this system conformally symplectic according to the formal definition that I will give in a moment of this kind of dissipative systems. Nevertheless, I want to, before giving the formal definitions and the statements of the theorem, I would like to point out that KM theory is a wonderful theorem that gives a constructive algorithm. So a recipe to give lower bounds on the perturbing parameter, ensuring the existence of KM tori. So it gives the theorem holds for epsilon less or equal than a threshold that I call epsilon km of omega. And epsilon k of omega is the value, the, the threshold that we can find uh, by means of the application of the theorem. And it is a constructive algorithm. But then we want to compare this threshold with what? And here we have a bifurcation, let's say. So on the one hand, we can compare with the astronomical value, 10 to the minus three, or the blackness of the moon, or whatever you want or rather with the numerical value. So uh, the, the, uh, for example, as obtained implementing uh, Green's method, frequency analysis or whatever you want. Let me call it the experimental breakdown value, value that is either astronomical or numerical value. And then the main question is, uh, does KM theory provide realistic estimates with a rigorous version epsilon K omega closer to the experimental value? The answer is yes. Yes, although for a long time, it was believed that KM theory was giving results very far from reality. In fact, the very first application of uh, uh, this uh, KM estimates to celestial mechanics were, was given by Michel Hennon, who found uh, estimates far from reality. But Hennon in his paper in, uh, in, at the end of the 60s was very well aware of the fact that uh, um, that was uh, the situation at that time he was a master in computers, uh, so he was uh, probably knowing that uh, computers could help uh, in finding uh, good uh, KM results. So what is the situation nowadays? So nowadays, we can have much better results. And the way we do, of course, uh, there are several different ways, but the way in which I will concentrate today is to use uh, these two main ingredients, uh, which are the a posterior approach and computer assisted techniques. So let me spend a few words about this. Uh, what is the posterior approach? It means that uh, we can often reduce the existence of invariant tori to find the solution of a functional equation. We, it will be an invariance equation. And if we have an approximate solution that satisfies some non-degeneracy conditions of this invariance equation, then we can prove that uh, near the approximate torus, uh, we can find the true torus. The advantage of using this method is that uh, uh, you don't need to deal with a nearly integrable system. You don't need to use action angle variables, which are the co a consequence rather than an assumption of the theory. This method that was started by Rafael de la Llave in his tutorial and then the paper in uh, 2005 with uh, Gonzalez, Jorba, Villanueva. So I put it in the center of everything. This a posteriori KM theory without action angle variables is exact uh, title of the paper. And it gave rise to different results. 
it was uh, uh, given uh, that proof was given in the sympathetic case. Uh, then, in the, we uh, with uh, Renato and Rafael, we extended to conformally sympathetic systems with uh, adding drift parameters. And then we have nowadays uh, um, very efficient KM estimates. It gives also a very efficient uh, experimental method, breakdown numerical method. It can be applied also to to find the local behavior, domains analyticity, existence of risk territory. And it applies uh, to many different contexts, including higher dimensional systems, uh, non twist story, and so on. So it is a very powerful method. And the second ingredient is computer assisted technique. So we, know, we now know that, uh, and I hope I convinced you, that perturbative methods need uh, a lot of computations. And therefore, we need uh, the computer to perform the expansions, uh, to check the KM estimates, and so on and so forth. But the computers introduce uh, rounding off and propagation errors. So we need to control these errors. And the way we do it is through computer assisted proof. But I want to be honest uh, since now, and as, as I was uh, saying in the backstage before the, the, the starting the talk uh, to the organizers, I would like to, to, uh, uh, to profit of this talk also to make a call, hall, call of help to the community because very often in celestial mechanics, uh, we don't have computer assisted proofs, uh, but we rather have uh, computer assisted validations. And validations means, uh, could mean uh, that uh, we make estimates of the errors, uh, rigorous estimates of the errors, uh, or we analytical estimates of the errors, or we make uh, uh, computations with uh, many digits, uh, for example, using MTFR. Uh, we need uh, this uh, uh, further step uh, to transform computer assisted validations uh, into computer assisted proofs uh, in uh, a, a way that can be used uh, by the community working in celestial mechanics. So I would like to, to stress uh, these two parts. Uh, now, today I will talk uh, mainly about a computer assisted, although I will give a results of a computer assisted proofs, I will mainly talk about a computer assisted validation that is uh, this uh, recent ongoing work with uh, Rafael Renato and Jean Kimeno. But before going to this work, uh, let me summarize here the table of uh, KAM estimates uh, uh, in celestial mechanics. Uh, so last week, uh, Jay gave uh, different results about uh, um, uh, computer assisted proofs in celestial mechanics. Now we focus on KM estimates on celestial mechanics. I hope I didn't forget uh, any, uh, I, I consulted with several people before giving this table, but uh, let me say the few results. I apologize if I forgot uh, some of the uh, rigorous KM estimates. So first of all, let me say that I started with the standard map and then you can say, well, the standard map is not celestial mechanics, uh, but uh, this is uh, something which is questionable because uh, the standard map is very, very close to the Poincaré map of the spin orbit problem. So we can use, in fact, we will use, in fact, here KM estimates for the standard map to, for the spin orbit problem. So let me start with this. And in the 90, we were giving with the Luigi Kerke estimates up to 86% of the numerical breakdown threshold. So I put here numerical or rather astronomical for the comparison with the astronomical value. I put in green when it is with the interval arithmetic or other methods to have computer assisted proofs. In light blue, computer assisted validations. So we had here 86% for the standard map that was improved to 93% by Rafael and Rana at the same time. And in 2016, there was a very nice paper by Figuera Saroluque who reached the 99.9% or the numerical breakdown threshold for the conservative standard map, non-twist map, and so on, using computer assisted proofs. Models of celestial mechanics. So the first one is the spin orbit problem, which dates back, uh, dates back uh, to my PhD thesis, and uh, uh, where I reached the 100% full consistency with the astronomical value of different uh, satellites and planets, moon, satellites of uh, Saturn, Mercury, and so on with computer assisted proof. Uh, the conservative uh, planar circular restricted three body problem. That was joint works uh, with uh, Luigi Kierke, 1997 to 2007. Again, 10 to the minus three was uh, the benchmark and we reached that in uh, using uh, uh, computer assisted proofs. Let me also mention uh, the conservative circular uh, three planetary body problem 
by Locatelli Giorgilli and later Locatelli Giorgilli and Sansotera, uh, reaching 100% of the astronomical values. And they know that uh, there is an ongoing work by Caracciolo, Locatelli, Sansotera, and I think also Volpi uh, on extra, extra solar planetary systems, and again with uh, computer assisted proofs. So all this uh, refers uh, to conservative systems. And for dissipative systems, we have just uh, these two results uh, for the standard map and the spin orbit problem, where we reach again 99.9% .9 of the numerical breakdown threshold. Of course, uh, the astronomical threshold is less than the numerical threshold. So you can reach 100%, but then you can reach uh, up to 999 uh, .9 or whatever of the numerical breakdown threshold. So the aim of my talk will be Conformally symplectic uh, uh, KM theory for conformally symplectic systems and precisely an application to uh, the spin orbit problem in celestial mechanics. So, so let me start uh, by giving the definition of uh, 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 conformally symplectic systems. We start uh, by introducing in this way for a family F mu of uh, maps defined on a symplectic manifold M with a symplectic form capital omega. We say that F nu is conformally symplectic if the pullback of F nu applied to omega is equal to lambda omega. So there exists a, a function lambda such that uh, this relation holds. Uh, that is, uh, the, 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 the map transforms uh, the symplectic form into a multiple of itself. We recover the symplectic case for lambda equal to one and uh, we also have that uh, for d equal to one, any map, any diffeomorphism is conformally symplectic. And taking the exterior derivative of this expression here, we have that for d greater or equal than two, lambda is a constant function. Of course, uh, we can generalize this uh, uh, definition also to continuous systems by saying that a vector field x mu is conformally symplectic if there exists lambda such that uh, L x mu omega is equal to lambda omega where X mu, Lx mu is uh, the lead derivative. And of course, uh, the flow satisfies a relation which is similar to the one for, uh, 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 for symplectic diffeomorphism. So next, uh, we, we, we need to say that uh, uh, conformally symplectic systems were uh, in fact uh, um, studied by several people, Adrashev, Baniyaga, Weisman, and uh, uh, they appear in different contexts, Hamiltonian systems with friction proportional to the velocity. So in particular in celestial mechanics, the spin orbit models that I'm going to describe later, but also Hamiltonian chains with uh, energy dissipation as studied by Jean-Pierre Ekman and uh, Wayne Cooney and other authors, uh, Euler-Lagrange uh, equations of exponentially discounted system, uh, Gaussian thermostats, uh, expand exponentially discounted systems with applications to models from finance. So they, they, they appear in several different contexts. And uh, uh, once we have defined uh, the conformally symplectic system, now we need to define the frequency, which must satisfy the well-known Diophantine condition that is uh, um, an inequality of this kind for maps. I will just uh, give the results for maps. Um, that is omega must satisfy the, the inequality omega over two pi times q minus p to the minus one. Q is an, an integer vector, p is a ve an integer, should be less or equal than a constant c times q to the tau, where c and, and tau are positive constants. And uh, uh, we know that if tau is greater than d minus one, the dimensions, then the set of the Yoffan time vectors is a full Lebesgue measure in Rd. So once we have defined the map and the frequency, we can define the tori. So for a family F mu of conformally symplectic maps, a KM torus with the Yoffan time frequency omega will be a d-dimensional invariant torus, which is described parametrically by an embedding K and the drift mu, which are solutions of the invariance equation. That is F mu composed with K U theta is equal to K U theta plus omega. So you have here a graphical representation of this, uh, of this uh, 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 situation, invariance equation. That is, you start with theta and end up on k of theta. From theta plus omega, you end up on, on k of theta plus omega. And then you want that f mu of k of theta is equal to k of theta plus omega, which is, in fact, an, a, an equation with two unknowns, which are k and mu. So 
be aware that uh, we have uh, two unknowns, uh, not only k, like in the symplectic k, uh, case, uh, but also the drift parameter mu. Next, uh, we want to give uh, um, explicit estimates. Uh, so we need norms, uh, and we can develop our results uh, using two different norms, uh, analytic norm and uh, Sobolev norm. So for analytic norms, we take analytic functions with the norm of the soup defined on the extended torus, which is the set of theta complex with real part in TD and the imaginary part bounded by some parameter rho greater than zero. Then in the Sobolev norm, we expand in Fourier series, and then we define the Sobolev space with this norm in, with index m. So we have uh, that uh, the, the, the HM is the set of uh, uh, functions with finite norm FM. So with these norms, uh, we are now able to give uh, the statement of the theorem. Once again, I want to mention that uh, the, for the symplectic case, it was given by De La Llave Gonzalez, Jorba uh, Villanueva. And I give here for conformally symplectic case, only for the analytic case, uh, for, for simplicity, because uh, it, it is simpler to, to state. And, uh, and also, uh, let me say that it is a, a, a simplified statement, uh, let's say, saying that uh, the theorem tells you that if you start with the family of mu of conformally symplectic maps, and if omega is diophantine, assume to have an approximate solution k0 mu0, which satisfies the invariance equation with an error term e0, Assume that uh, the solution is sufficiently approximate, uh, that is, uh, the norm of E0 over rho, the extended torus with parameter rho is small enough. Assume a suitable non degeneracy condition, which is, in fact, a, a, a technical condition on which I will come back uh, e e later on. Uh, then, under these conditions, there exists an exact solution, let's say, k star mu star, which satisfies exactly with the zero here, the invariance equation. And moreover, you, you have that. Uh, the true solution, k star mu star, is closer to the initial one because k star minus k0 as well as mu star minus mu0 are bounded by the norm of E0, which is small. So this is uh, uh, the statement of our theorem. I don't want to give the proof, which is uh, rather long and technical, but just uh, I would like to give an application. And beside, I would like to give, uh, for the moment, just uh, is a, a summary of uh, the main steps uh, which are needed to get to obtain the proof. So the first step, uh, in a nutshell, let's say, the, the first step is uh, to start with the approximate solution and uh, to construct a linearization of the invariance equation. Then we introduce an appro a new approximation, let's say from k0 mu0, we construct a new approximation as k1 mu, mu1, which is obtained from the initial one, k0 mu0, adding some corrections that are marked in red, w0 and sigma0. So what are these corrections? Uh, these corrections are such that the new approximation, k1 mu1, satisfies the invariance equation with an error which is quadratically smaller. And uh, uh, to do this, uh, we need to find the W0 and sigma 0. We need to solve uh, some cohomological equations, uh, which involve uh, first uh, small divisors, uh, hence the need of uh, a diophantine frequency, and uh, they require a non-degeneracy condition. Then we iterate the method, like in a, a Newton, uh, following a Newton quadratic iteration method. So we construct a sequence of approximate solution, E1, E2, E3, and so forth, every one with uh, errors which are quadratically smaller. We prove uh, the convergence uh, through a nash moser uh, approach, and then uh, we prove also the local uniqueness. So this is uh, a summary of uh, the proof. And let me say that uh, uh, this, uh, the main ingredients are, to summarize, the main ingredients are a complex extension of the domains uh, to get uh, Cauchy estimates, which allow to bound uh, the derivatives, uh, the Diophantine inequality, the non-degeneracy, the Newton quadratic iteration method, and of course, if you want to have uh, this uh, uh, theorem as a rigorous theorem with uh, explicit uh, uh, estimates that uh, you need to implement a computer assisted proof because uh, to find uh, the sequence of approximate solutions that uh, you need to, to implement uh, to use a computer, as I will mention later, and also to check the KM estimates that uh, you need to, to use a computer. So, which are the consequences of this a posterior approach? First of all, it is uh, that it provides a very efficient 
algorithm. And this algorithm will give very refined quantitative estimates, as I was mentioning in the table before. Besides, it gives also a numerical method to determine the breakdown threshold. Not only this, we have a number of other results, like the local behavior near quasi-periodic solutions, partial justification of the numerical breakdown threshold called the Green's method. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Falcolini. There is a nice explanation that I will show in a moment of the collision bundle mechanism for the breakdown of the Torre by Calleja and Figueras. The study of uh, analyticity domains and whisker Torre, which are joint works uh, with uh, Rafael and Renato. So let me focus now on this uh, collision bundle mechanism, which I think uh, could be of interest uh, to some people because it is um, a relation with the normally hyperbolic environment manifolds. Uh, that is, uh, a, they, 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 they were using uh, this a posterior approach, uh, one can find the coordinate change uh, such that the linearized dynamics uh, is a constant matrix with one eigenvalue equal to one and the other eigenvalue equal to lambda. In other words, uh, when introduces uh, a matrix and tilde, which is given by the tangent and stable bundles at the torus, EC and ES, and the action of the derivative uh, uh, on this matrix M tilde becomes just a shift uh, multiplied by this uh, matrix uh, 1, 0, 0, lambda. So if you iterate, you obtain this expression here that you can use uh, to bound the norm of DFJ mu composed with K as given here on the stable and center bundle, which shows that uh, the torus is indeed a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold. Then, as shown in the paper by Calleja and Figueras, by bootstrap, the regularity of the manifold implies the regularity of K up to breakdown, which means that the tangent and stable bundles are also analytic. And since the Lyapunov of multipliers are constant along the family of the environment tori, then the only mechanism in which you can have that the hyperbolicity breakdown is when the bundles collide. And this is a video, a movie, which shows the angles between the stable, red, and the tangent bundles as the perturbing parameter increases. And when it reaches the breakdown value, you see that the two bundles collide. The stable and tangent bundles collide. So this is, these are applications of these theorems. And now let me come to uh, the spin orbit problem. So first of all, I would like to give uh, 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 the definition of the problem. So we consider a satellite, for example, the moon, which moves around uh, a central body, the Earth. We assume that the moon is a triaxial satellite with uh, moments of inertia I1, I2, I3. The central mass of the satellite moves on a Keplerian orbit around the planet. And beside, the, the, the spin axis is perpendicular, not uh, obliquity, not with obliquity. It is perpendicular to the orbit plane and uh, uh, coinciding with the shortest physical axis. And beside that, we will consider also dissipative torques, uh, that is uh, the tidal torque, uh, which is due to the no rigidity of the satellites. So this is uh, the geography of the, the geometry, sorry, of the problem, that is uh, we see everything from above, okay? So this is uh, the orbit of the satellite, uh, this barycenter of the satellite moves on this ellipse, with semi-major axis A. The coordinates of this, uh, the barycenter are the, is the orbital radius R and the true anomaly F, which are known Keplerian functions of the time, since uh, the, the orbit is uh, an ellipse. And this is uh, the, uh, the direction of the longest axis of the satellite, with the peri and which makes an angle X with the periaxis line. So this uh, angle X gives indeed the rotation of the satellite around its spin axis. So the equation of motion, uh, no, let me first say that uh, why are, is this problem interesting? Because uh, uh, this problem brings immediately to the study of spin orbit resonances, which of course, uh, when you have uh, that uh, the uh, period of revolution and the period of rotation of the satellite uh, are in a commensurability relation that is uh, the ratio is equal to p over q for some integers p over q. And this relation means that after q revolutions around the main body, the satellite makes p rotations. So this is uh, the nicest example is the moon, which is in a one-to-one -one resonance, 
So this, uh, the, the, the 28 days is the period, rotational and revolutional period, and this is the reason why the moon points at the same face to the Earth. And this is common to many other satellites of the solar system, the Galilean satellites of Jupiter, the main satellites of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, even uh, Charon for Pluto and so on. All of them are in one-to-one -one resonance or synchronous resonance, and the, the only body in a, of the solar system in a spin orbit resonance, but not uh, a synchronous one is Mercury here, which is in a three to two resonance, which means that after two revolutions about the sun, Mercury makes three rotations uh, around its spin axis and with a precision to the fourth decimal digit. Then tidal effects. Tidal effects, as I was mentioning before, are extremely important on the long time run because they help to give an evolutionary scenario of the solar system. So we want to include them in our equations of motion. But first, let me uh, give uh, the equations for the conservative system. So assume for the moment that you, are, you have no rigidity, then the equation of motion is given here. It is a second order differential equation in the rotational angle X. Uh, epsilon here is short for a parameter proportional to I2 minus I1 over I3. So the flattening of the body. A is uh, the semi-major axis. R and F are known functions of the time. And uh, therefore you have that this equation corresponds uh, to a one dimensional time dependent Hamiltonian of this form. Y squared over two plus epsilon times a perturbing function, which depends just on X and T, and it is periodic in X and T. And this Hamiltonian is integrable when epsilon equal to zero. And it is uh, easy to see that also when the X and T is for circular orbits, you have that the system is integrable because uh, R is equal to A and F in normalized units is just the time. So there is just one angle here, which is uh, two X minus two T. So this is uh, for the conservative case. Now, let me come to the dissipative case. This is uh, the equation for the with uh, dissipation. With dissipation, I change uh, the right-hand side and I call uh, the dissipation TD, which will be a linear function of the velocity. So the system is, uh, can, it can be shown that it is conformally symplectic with symplectic matrix uh, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So then we can we say, what is the exact form for this uh, uh, tidal torque. Okay, so we give uh, two models. Uh, one model is uh, the full time dependent tidal torque, uh, which has this expression here. It is minus eta a over r to the six x dot minus f dot, where eta is a constant which depends on the dissipative, uh, uh, on the physical features of the satellite density, rigidity, love number, quality factor, and so on. Beside, we, it is often used in models of celestial mechanics to take the average of this dissipation over one orbital period. And then you obtain this expression here, minus eta L bar times X dot minus N bar over L bar, where both L bar and N bar are functions of the eccentricity. These are exact expressions, are not expansions. They are exact. So in other words, you have, uh, you immediately recognize that uh, in the average tidal torque, you have minus lambda x dot minus a drift parameter, or minus mu times x dot minus a drift parameter, which depends on the eccentricity. So we will, but we will mainly consider this one, the model one, that is the full model with the time dependent tidal torque. And then what I want to, to show in the rest of this talk is the spin orbit KM project, which is an ongoing project with Rafael uh, Renato Calleja. Uh, Jean Guimeno, who is a postdoc in Roma with the uh, PRIN IHLMEC project. So this project consists of three parts. First one is a reduction of the spin orbit problem to a map, to a conformally symplectic map, because it is easier to handle maps than continuous systems. And this will allow us to construct, uh, to give a numerical construction of the tori. The second part is KM estimates for the dissipative spin orbit problem. And the third part is the computation of the numerical breakdown threshold. So let me start with the first part. Well, I just summarize here. I don't want to give full details, but let me say that we can reduce the study of the continuous system 
to uh, a, a, a map by introducing a map PE of the dissipative spin orbit problem with full tidal torque by uh, following uh, using the following steps. Uh, first of all, it is convenient to introduce, uh, uh, to use uh, the eccentric anomaly as independent variable replacing the time. Then we introduce uh, these uh, uh, coordinates, beta and gamma, which replace x and y, y is x dot, which depends upon time through Kepler's equation, t equal to u minus e sine of u. It is well known that this is Kepler equation. And uh, in this way, we don't need, uh, using these variables, we don't need to solve uh, Kepler's equation. Then uh, these variables, beta and gamma, must satisfy this relation. We can compute uh, the two pi ma time map of this equation and come back uh, to the original variables x and y. This gives us uh, the, the spin orbit map, PE, that they call PE, in components uh, PE1, PE2, which give uh, the expression here, the map, uh, such that uh, from x, y, you obtain a new system, new variables, x bar, y, pri y bar, implementing the map PE. So we reduce uh, to the two pi time map PE. We can even compute uh, the conformal factor, exactly, of this map. And this is given by this expression here, the exponential of minus theta times a function of the eccentricity. So you realize that uh, for eta equal to zero, you have lambda equal to one, so Hamiltonian case. For eta greater than zero, you have a contractive system, and for there is a minus here. And for eta negative, you have an expansive system. And then you can exactly rephrase the definition that I was giving before for a map F mu, but now for a map PE, to give the definition of a KM attractor for the spin orbit problem with dissipative tidal torque. A, as a, an invariant torus, which is a, a, a represented by an embedding k and a drift parameter e. Okay, so the eccentricity plays the role of the drift parameter, which satisfies this equation, invariance equation. And the, indeed, the solution of this invariance equation is the centerpiece of the KM theory. Um, we consider two tori for simplicity to give two examples. Well, the first one is the natural one, the, the golden ratio, square root of five plus one over two. Then another number, which is closer to one, because we want to go th to, toward the, the one to one resonances, which are frequency omega equal to one. So we take these two numbers, which satisfy the Diophant time conditions. And then let me say that uh, uh, we can give uh, estimates uh, of the drift parameter, because if we fix omega one and omega two, then we wonder what is the good eccentricity, starting eccentricity that we will need to implement the KM estimates. But we can use this machinery to compute through standard tricks the frequency to provide the graph of the rotation number versus the eccentricity. This is a zoom on the omega two, the second rotation number, and we find that a good eccentricity value for omega, the golden ratio is 0 0.31 and 0 0.25 for the second frequency omega two. Next, well, this is full of symbols. I don't want to, this slide full of symbols. I don't want to go through all, everything, but just want to say that uh, the whole KM algorithm, which comes out from the proof of the KM theory is contained in this page. So, this page gives exactly the algorithm that one can follow to construct the tori. So we start with, we fix the Poincaré map for the spin orbit problem PE. We start with uh, um, a approximate values K and D. Of course, we fix also omega. So we fix PE and we, we fix omega. We start with K and D and we compute uh, the, the error E. Then we compute all other quantities. And uh, then we are led to solve a system of equations to find uh, the new corrections. And this uh, uh, will need, to, uh, and for this, uh, we will need to, to impose that uh, the determinant of this matrix is different from zero, which is exactly the non-degeneracy condition that I was uh, stating in the theorem. Okay, so we find it uh, within the proof. 
we need to solve the cohomological equations, which means uh, to, to, to use also the Diophantine condition. And finally, we end up with a new approximation, Ke of the invariance equation. So we can, we, we can implement this, uh, this scheme several times, and uh, we find uh, that uh, it gives uh, an extremely efficient method because uh, each step of this algorithm just needs uh, shifting functions, multiplying, composing, and differentiating functions, and just solving different equations uh, with constant coefficients. Moreover, if we start uh, with an FFT for K, for the embedding with n Fourier modes, uh, then each Newton step uh, needs only orders of n storage and orders of n log n operations. So I want to give uh, an example here with uh, that uh, we, we provide in the first part uh, of the project uh, with uh, Rafael, Renato, and Jean. That is the construction of the theory, implementing this uh, KM algorithm. We start with a very low uh, value of epsilon, let's say 10 to the minus 4, which is uh, the violet, the pink um, uh, curb here. Then we increase uh, and we find this, this, this up to the yellow one, which has the bigger value of epsilon. And we can follow the tori in this way for increasing, just implementing uh, the algorithm that I was saying before. This is for omega two and this is for omega one. And you see that the tori, of course, uh, becomes uh, um, less regular as epsilon increases. So we have a mean to, to use uh, the map and uh, to follow the tori. So now let us use, uh, let us come to the KM estimates. But I want to, 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 to go back uh, to, to the conservative case, which was, uh, in fact, my, my, as I was mentioning before, my PhD thesis, where I studied by the, spin the conservative spin orbit problem with the trigonometric potential, that is, instead of having the, the full expansion, the full potential, A over R cube, sine of 2x minus 2f, I was making an expansion in the eccentricity and retaining only six, 10, at most 20 coefficients. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it is possible to use a KM theory using at that time I was using not the posterior method, but a Lynch series expansion and uh, uh, using uh, 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 KM, developing uh, uh, refined KM estimates. It is possible to prove that for the true eccentricity of the moon and for the true value of the perturbing parameter, which is this value here, the astronomical value, there exists bounding tori, KM bounding tori for the conservative case, bounding the motion of the moon from above and below. Why do I say that, uh, why do I use this word uh, bounding the motion? Because uh, as I was mentioning before, the Hamiltonian is one dimensional 10 dependent. So the phase space is three dimensional. The invariant KM tori are two dimensional. So this means that in this case, uh, in the conservative case, KM tori uh, trap the motion and KM uh, theory gives uh, a stability property in the sense of, of confinement of the motion. So the motion of the moon, the synchronous resonance is bounded between uh, these uh, two frequencies, omega plus and omega minus below uh, and above zero, one. And the proof is computer assisted in the sense that uh, uh, rounding off and propagation errors uh, were uh, controlled uh, through interval arithmetic. It is uh, split all operations. It, well, you are all uh, uh, well uh, uh, experts in the field. So let me just say in a very few words. Uh, split, well, in fact, I must say that I was learning uh, this uh, technique by Jean-Pierre Ekman and Oscar Lamford at the time I was at uh, ETH in Zurich. So um, split all operations into elementary operations that represent real numbers as intervals provide upper and lower bounds. At the time I was using a box machine. So using a bit representation, controlling the guard bits of the mantis and so on, and then performing elementary operations upon intervals. Of course, everything, this is, uh, 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 makes uh, the proof uh, rigorous, but let me say also that uh, it is um, a very long procedure. Um, uh, the, the order, the program was running about uh, a factor seven or eight times as lower than the program without interval arithmetic. So, but uh, now let me say, uh, what can we say about uh, the dissipity spin orbit problem? Well, we can rephrase uh, the theorem. Once again, if we assume that we have uh, a, an initial approximate solution of the invariance equation, 
and there's treatable non-degeneracy condition, which in fact are very close to those for the standard map. Uh, if uh, uh, the, the parameters are small enough, then, so if uh, this is the theorem or the rigorous theorem, if the parameters are small enough, but I don't say how, how small, then there exists an exact solution, K star, E star of the invariance equation. So we have tori also for the spin orbit problem. We can give all the estimates and uh, this, uh, these estimates are similar, but not exactly the same as for the standard map. There are technical difficulties in estimating uh, domains, which make the proof uh, quite long. Let me say that uh, we had uh, a similar results in the paper with uh, Luigi Kierke in 2009 for the average tidal torque. And uh, know that there is a very recent result for the average torque by Bartuccelli, Dean, Corsi, Gentile. I hope I didn't forget any of the authors. Um, and, uh, uh, but let me say that uh, the, in our case, uh, we do not uh, assume that, uh, as I was doing in my thesis, that uh, uh, we need to have a trigonometric potential. There is no average dissipation, so the full system, and there is no link between epsilon and data. And then we can implement the model, we can implement the, the algorithm, the, the, the KM estimates, and we end up with this, uh, which I call computer assisted validation. I don't call it computer assisted proof because we don't make um, uh, interval arithmetic, at least for the moment. As I was saying before, I make a call for help. Um, and uh, uh, we, um, but we are able to state the following. We can make a continuation start for a fixed value of uh, the dissipation, let's say 10 to the minus three or whatever. We can implement uh, with a multi-precision arithmetic, 50 digits. We can uh, find uh, the solution of the um, invariance equation, assuming a Newton's method with uh, tolerance, for example, 10 to the minus 45. We can control the tails of the full expansion of the embedding what we did recently was also to implement uh, the method with more digits, uh, 55, 60 digits, and check uh, that everything is consistent and nothing happens uh, when using uh, more digits. Of course, uh, this is not a proof, uh, but this is, uh, as I was saying before, just a sort of validation. So we can construct the tori, we can check the KM estimates to prove the convergence of the iteration, and uh, we end up uh, with the following results. Uh, again, omega 1 and omega 2 are whatever you want. The, 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 the problem does not uh, need uh, that, you speci that you take a specific omega 1, omega 2. It suffices that you take the Yofantai numbers. But you can see that uh, you find uh, the eccentricities, uh, and uh, you end up uh, with uh, values of epsilon, which are a very good. Why do I say very good? Because uh, these are the, the values of the theorem, which are much bigger than the astronomical value. We do not compare now. We, we, we could compare everything, if we compare everything we, with the astronomical value, which is of the order of 10 to the minus four for Moon or Mercury, we are much beyond this limit. This limit is uh, comparable with uh, um, irregular asteroids, let's say. So, and it is, it is in fact at the, close to the breakdown. So um, uh, this is uh, the result, uh, but then we want to say, well, is this result, uh, does it, is it worth uh, continuing and make maybe a computer assisted proof? Uh, that is, is this result, uh, well, it is close to, the, it is uh, beyond the astronomical value, but is it close to the experimental value, the numerical value? So the third part of the project with uh, Rafael, Renato, and Joan is uh, the computation of the numerical breakdown threshold. And uh, the, the way we prefer to compute uh, the numerical breakdown threshold is indeed uh, to use a method uh, which relies upon uh, the KM algorithm. Because the KM algorithm itself uh, can give you a numerically efficient criterion to estimate uh, the numerical breakdown threshold in the following way. You construct, uh, uh, the aim is to construct the solution of this invariance equation. So you can take, uh, the, you can construct an approximation of the embedding K. Uh, you can construct a trigonometric approximation, let's say with a finite number, say capital L of Fourier components. And then the theorem, the theory tells you that 
uh, when you have a, a regular increase, a regular behavior of the Sobolev norm of this uh, trigonometric approximation of the embedding, then you have the torus. And when you have a blow up of the norms, uh, this blow up uh, corresponds to the breakdown of the tori. So we implement uh, this method. Uh, you can imagine now that we have all the tools, uh, as I was saying in part one, to construct uh, numerically the tori, and uh, we end up uh, with uh, these values, uh, which in fact uh, are extremely close, up to 99.9% .9 of the KM estimates. And we can do both in the non-average, average method, and whatever. Um, you can think now, why didn't you use uh, other methods uh, to, to estimate uh, the experimental, the numerical breakdown threshold? We could have used, uh, for example, Green's method. And in fact, uh, is this, uh, we, we provide some results also for this method within uh, part uh, three of our project. This method was developed by John Green in 1979 for the conservative standard map. And it is based uh, on the conjecture that the breakdown of the tori corresponds uh, to a transition from stability to instability of those periodic orbits uh, whose frequency is given by the rational approximants to the gold to the to the diophantine vector, diophantine frequency. So if uh, omega is the diophantine frequency, you compute uh, the rational approximants, for example, the Fibonacci numbers for the golden ratio. You compute the stability of the corresponding periodic orbits, for example, using as green does the residue criterion, which is a measure of the stability of the or periodic orbits. Uh, and then you look at the transition for, of these orbits from stability to instability. In the, this, this, thing, this method works well for the conservative case. It has some problems in the dissipative case for two reasons. One is that uh, in the dissipative case, to find the stability, a reliable uh, estimate of the stability of the periodic orbits, you need to wait for a transient time because you have a dissipative system. So you need to wait that your model ends up on the attractor. And once you are on the attractor, you measure the stability. So what is the transient number of iterations that or time that you need to wait to be on the attractor? Well, it depends on several factors, the initial conditions, the dissipative factor, the model that you use. So it is difficult to predict in principle. The second question is that uh, for dissipative systems, uh, you have an extra difficulty due to the fact that dissipative systems uh, mm, uh, show the appearance of Arnold tongs, uh, that is uh, uh, intervals uh, like, like it is shown here, you have here the drift and you have the perturbing parameter epsilon. And there is uh, for a fixed value of the perturbing parameter, there is a, a, a wool interval in which you can find periodic orbits with the same period. So nevertheless, uh, this method gives results which are consistent to those that I was showing before for the Sobolev, using the Sobolev criterion. So let me come now to the conclusion. And as I was saying before, uh, we, the, main, the main results that I was showing were part of this project uh, for which I give uh, these uh, uh, references, which are in fact uh, uh, it's a work in progress or preprint with uh, Rafael Calleja, Jean Guimeno and Rafael de la Llave. The first part is uh, the, construct, the definition of the conformally symplectic spin orbit map and the construction of the invariant tori. The second part is uh, the KM estimates for invariant or in the dissipative spin orbit problem. And the third part is uh, the, the estimate or the, the computation of the numerical breakdown threshold of the invariant attractors for the dissipative spin orbit problem. Once again, I was, uh, as I was saying before, I want to be very honest. So this, uh, these results uh, were uh, at, the, at the present stage are a validation Although there exists in the literature several result, computer assisted proofs, we need to, make, to implement com, uh, interval arithmetic in order to transform this uh, computer assisted validation into a computer assisted proof. But uh, uh, this is common not only to KM theory. Let me say that uh, uh, there are many other results uh, that I know at the moment uh, which run from uh, um, uh, 
perturbative methods to, to uh, uh, compute the orbital lifetime of space debris to Nekoroshev type uh, estimates uh, to estimate the long-term behavior of uh, uh, systems like uh, satellite problems, uh, extrasolar planetary systems, uh, and uh, uh, many other results uh, for which uh, it is really worthwhile to compute, to, to implement uh, computer-assisted techniques. Uh, and the reason why it is worthwhile be is because uh, I thought uh, I, I convinced you that the uh, perturbative methods and KM methods uh, provide uh, very powerful techniques with uh, realistic estimates uh, on the parameters. So this is uh, my conclusion and I hope uh, I stimulated uh, the um, further collaboration also on behalf uh, of uh, my co-authors. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander, for a, a terrific talk. Uh, we now open the floor for questions. We have plenty of time for questions, people. Um, yeah, I, I have one. So Alessandra, if you can, can you go back to your, your slide with 10 to the minus 50 with, yeah, exactly this one. <laughs> um, so, you, you know, in, I mean, at the, at the very end, you said that we need some interval arithmetic uh, to kind of to make all of these uh, caps instead of calves. <laughs> and uh, so, but I mean, I'm assuming that it's not only interval arithmetic. There are, are there like more like a theoretical hurdles? Like, uh, I mean, some, because some of the computations you've done, yeah, you, you must have done some truncations to finite number of Fourier coefficients and- uh, No, 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 this is the theorem. Okay, the, the KM theorem is typically composed by two parts. One is that the construct, you start from an approximate solution and then you construct the, 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 a better and better approximate solution by means of these Newton methods. This is a computer program, let's say, mm -hmm. that makes a constructive version of the KM algorithm that I was showing before. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is the first program. Then uh, the first part uh, or first computer program. And already here, you might need uh, to implement uh, interval arithmetic uh, and you could end up uh, with the torus, which is represented by an interval, okay? Then you end up uh, with uh, uh, your new approximate solution, which, we, which is much better than the original one because uh, you have implemented several times uh, the KM machinery, okay? To construct a better and better approximate solution with Newton iteration and then you implement, uh, uh, you need to check a set of computer, of KM estimates, a set of long KM estimates, about 10 inequalities that uh, your parameters need to satisfy. So also in that part, you can implement, so this part of the estimates means that you make everything rigorous in the sense, theoretical in the sense that you estimate the, uh, the, 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 that the algorithm is converging, that the iteration is converging, the final domain and so on and so forth. The second part is uh, the check of the estimates. You can implement interval arithmetic also on this second part and you end up with a rigorous version of the theorem. So really what we need to make uh, these results rigorous is just implementing interval arithmetic. I see, but I you're, invite you're... also my, my yeah. co-authors, eh? Rafael, mm -hmm. Jean, uh, I know that Renato was not able to, to attend today, but uh, if you want to, uh, to comment also on this part, uh, you're welcome. So can I, can I ask a question, maybe uh, refining a little? You had a table at the beginning where you had actually computer-assisted proofs, computer-assisted proofs, computer-assisted proofs by yourself and Jordi Luis and Alex Haro and so on. And then the newer ones that were uh, not proofs is the is it the polynomial versus non-polynomial nonlinearity in the older ones or those polynomial nonlinearities or or what sort of the the change in difficulty that makes you have computer assisted proofs in in these earlier results but no computer assisted proofs in the more okay. recent results. So the first answer is uh, the difference uh, <laughs> between. Uh, this part and the new part is uh, uh, that I'm, at, I, I, speak, uh, I speak about myself, I'm getting older. So <laughs> I'm getting lazy. 
And uh, this is uh, the, only, the only way that is, uh, uh, while uh, there is technically, there is no difficulty uh, that is, uh, uh, the, the system here is even more complete uh, than the system here uh, the, for the standard map or the, the conservative spin orbit problem. So in principle, but in principle, there is no difficulty because we have everything uh, mm -hmm. ready. So the, what is uh, the, the step that we need to perform to make uh, this, uh, I call it validation. I don't know if it is the right word, but uh, let us assume that it is this one. The validation, the transformation from validation to uh, proof is uh, the implementation of interval arithmetic. So the program is not easy. I mean, uh, the program, each of these programs uh, that uh, give uh, these results are not easy. They, 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 I remember the one with uh, uh, Luigi in, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, three body problem was a nightmare. It was uh, 15,000 lines. I, 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 my mother tongue was Fortran. For, so we, I was programming in Fortran, so it was 15,000 lines. And then because uh, we needed to, to split uh, every operation into elementary operations, and then we needed to construct our own uh, sim symbolic algebra in Fortran, let's say, so operations are between uh, uh, sum, subtraction, multiplication, division, expansions for the exponentials, logarithms, sine, cosine, and so on. So this is uh, the, the technical difficulty. If there is a way to do it in a faster, and, and beside uh, what at that time I, I was uh, working, uh, so the only, the, the way I know it, I know that uh, Locatelli and other people are making, uh, and also uh, uh, I think also, uh, Figueras, if I remember well, and the uh, co-authors make uh, now the, the in interval arithmetic in a better way, multiplying by some factors and controlling the factors. But at that time I was uh, doing, especially in my PhD thesis, I was uh, using a box machine and I was uh, uh, expanding uh, uh, the, um, using the bit representation of the machine with 64 bits uh, and controlling uh, the two extra guard bits and controlling the operations on the on the last bits, so everything this makes everything uh, feasible, but it it requires time. And the, in the way it, it was doing it uh, in the 90s is uh, extremely time consuming. So this is why maybe there are faster ways, or uh, could be. I, I was talking also with Hugo in the past days, and it would be great to have uh, some um, uh, help from the community. Uh, to 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 be able to implement uh, perturbative methods uh, uh, using maybe uh, uh, I don't know the the, the subroutines or uh, functions uh, that allow to make the proofs uh, computer assisted. I hope I explain myself now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, somehow these second parts, these, uh, I mean, these conditions, I mean, th there's a bit of functional analysis. I mean, you're describing the fact that you need to compose with uh, or to uh, multiply with exponentials. And I mean, that, that part for, for these last two projects, I mean, that's, that's what is basically remaining to be done, right? The, to, to, we to need to implement the... uh, interval. Okay, let me stress also that, that there is another uh, difference between uh, this last part and the previ previous part. Uh, Besides the fact that uh, we are dealing with a dissipative system, of course, uh, which is more difficult than the conservative one, the first part. Okay, and then the we implement uh, interval arithmetic. Uh, sorry, we implement uh, the a posteriori method here, which is uh, very effective. And I think it is more effective, at least, uh, uh, than uh, the results I was uh, using at the time. Mm -hmm. So yes. the method is more powerful. It is adaptable to different uh, systems, not only conservative, but also dissipative. So what remains to do is uh, uh, to implement uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, computer assisted interval arithmetic on the, uh, these uh, KM results. Okay, thank you. So maybe if, if I may ask this, it's a bit similar a question. Uh, so uh, you use the Newton iteration to compute approximations. And so what many people in the computer assisted community do is then, so then at the end, after the Newton iteration has converged in quotation marks, then use a Newton-Kantorovich argument or a fixed point argument to conclude from that 
that there is a solution nearby the approximate one. But that's obviously not what you are doing. So, so, so uh, the question is why not? And, or, or in other words, can we perhaps regard these KAM estimates as a replacement for the uh, newton kantorovich argument? So it is a bit surprising for, for people in our community that you use a Newton iteration, but do not, con do not close it, so to say, by a newton kantorovich argument. Well, this, uh, this second part uh, that you're mentioning is, uh, thank you very much for your question, it's very interesting, uh, is in fact uh, the second part of the uh, KM theory. Uh, that is, uh, uh, when we make uh, this, uh, with this uh, uh, when we implement uh, this uh, proof, uh, let's say, we start, uh, we, we, we compute uh, the, uh, the new approximation let's say w, uh, k1 new one and then we iterate and then according to nash moser uh, sorry yeah to nash moser iteration method we need to check uh, that uh, the solution converges uh, to a final solution and this uh, means uh, to first of all uh, to um, uh, to implement a nash moser scheme that is uh, to uh, for example in the analytic case you need to define a smaller and smaller domain because you're using a Cauchy estimate. And uh, uh, beside uh, you, you need to, uh, 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 and the, for this, uh, you need to control the small divisors and you need uh, to provide the uh, convergence or the method to the, or the sequence of solutions to the true solutions. So this is uh, the content of the KM method, the KM, uh, the KM proof. So this is, uh, uh, of course, uh, the um, uh, the um, intrinsic in the uh, yeah. So Rafael was also commenting on the chat that uh, uh, the Newton Cantorovich method does not work because the Newton method is in, is unbounded. So you need to use uh, this uh, this KM proof. The, the proof of the KM method is. Uh, to, to, to introduce a smoothing operator, so which are defined on a scale of Banach spaces. I don't want to be too technical, but uh, this is the content. You introduce a smoothing operators, which are defined on different scales of Banach spaces and prove the convergence of this uh, uh, iteration methods. And in the analytic case, uh, you can do it in a, a quite a straightforward way by reducing uh, the domains by uh, different factors which are chosen in a particular way in such a way that the final domain is non-empty. This is the proof of the KM theorem. If you want, I can show you more details. And, and the computer assisted part in, part in these KM, uh, KAM estimates is to compute all these expansions, right? So uh, uh, what, what, what is- Compute both uh, the initial uh, approximation. Okay, that, that's, okay, that's, that's just approximation. Yes, that's clear. Yes, and also to compute, to check uh, the KM estimates. Because uh, you will have, uh, once you have your approximation, you have some estimates, uh, which are in fact uh, this, uh, uh, second part of the theorem, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the definition, the convergence of the method, uh, which provides you the convergence of the method. Um, and there, there are some estimates, uh, some inequalities. Uh, so you need also to check these inequalities. This, this is the easiest part, let's say. And, and, you want and the to inequalities, they, they just contain parameters which you know, or which yes. come from them? Yes, okay. exactly. Which uh, are given from the first part. Exactly. If it doesn't work, and if uh, the final estimates fail, what you have to do is uh, to, to take a smaller value of epsilon. So you have to tune the, the, the perturbing parameter. Okay. So we arrived up to epsilon equal to 10 to the minus 2. If uh, we were to try with 10 to the minus 1, we end up uh, that the estimates fail. So you have to, to uh, uh, decrease uh, the value of epsilon until uh, you get uh, the, the, that the all estimates are satisfied, which means that uh, the, there is the convergence of the method and the proof of the theorem. And that's how you discover this threshold value. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. Actually, I have another question, but um, so. Um, this uh, you, you talked about this non-degeneracy condi non condition. 
is that we assume a non-degeneracy condition. Is that an assumption which is verified at some point uh, or can you verify it at some point or is that an assumption which you have to make and that's it? Uh, no, you can verify it. Uh, you can verify it because uh, if uh, we go, sorry, if we go back to this, uh, to the KM, uh, to the, okay, here. Uh, essentially, the, the non-degeneracy condition is that the determinant of this matrix is different from zero. Here, lambda is the conformal factor, so it is a number. And all these quantities uh, depend upon the initial, uh, the, 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 depend on PE, on omega, and uh, you can plug in numbers and verify that uh, the determinant of this function is different, of this matrix is different from zero. So, yes. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay. Any other any other questions? Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, I say we uh, we thank Alessandra again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thanks again, everybody, for coming and hanging out and chatting. And uh, we'll we'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.